You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You're listening to the Archaeology Show. TAS goes behind the headlines to bring you the real stories about archaeology and the history around us. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome to the Archaeology Podcast. I'm Chris Webster. And I'm April Camp Whitaker. On today's show, we talk to Sir Barry Cunliffe about the ancient Celts. Let's dig a little deeper. All right, welcome back to episode 39 of the Archaeology Podcast. April, how's it going? It's going really well. Awesome, awesome. So uh, we're not going to waste any time here because we've got a, I think, a first for possibly the entire Archaeology Podcast Network. We've got a three-peat. We've got uh, (laughs) uh, somebody who was on two episodes before and now a third episode because he's such a prolific writer and has such interesting things to say. Sir Barry Cunliffe, welcome back to the Archaeology Show. Thank you very much. All right. So we had you and we'll have these links in the show notes in case people want to are new to the podcast and they want to go back and listen to the other episodes. We talked about uh, one of Barry's new books on the ocean in episode 24. And then we just had a talk with Barry uh, about his life as an archaeologist, his career uh, in episode 26. So go check those out. And again, they will be linked in the show notes. But today... We're talking about a second edition of a book Barry wrote back in, and the, the research I found said the first edition was 1997 uh, for the ancient Celts. Is that right, Barry? That's right. Yes, 20 years ago. Nice, nice. So you've got a second edition out. It's out now. We'll link to that in the show notes as well. Um, you guys sent us, a, sent us a copy, and I've had a chance to look through it. And it's very interesting because as somebody, honestly, in the United States, I... I knew very little about the Celts. I mean, of course, you hear that word all the time. You hear about them. Um, you you hear about Stonehenge and all the big the big fancy things, but really diving deep into the history and where they came from, and really how far uh, field they they kind of stretched was uh, was really interesting. So, uh, Barry, why don't you start out and just? I think this is going to be a chat really about the ancient Celts, honestly. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about what's prompted this second edition, like what new research has been found in the last 20 years to kind of update the book. But we'll get to that uh, later on. But first, who were the Celts? What, what is something people don't know about the ancient Celts, like who they were? <laughs> well, well, I think a l- large number of us um, would uh, regard ourselves as Celts. Um, but mm. uh, w- w- who you are and where you are at any one time, you'll have a different view of the Celts to someone else. So um, if we start off by saying who were the Celts to the Romans, for example, who were um, their, their neighbors, or to the Greeks who were their neighbors. Uh, the Celts were um, barbarians who lived in um, Central Europe and uh, in Western Europe. And they were a, a troublesome a group of barbarians. To start with, um, the Greeks traded with them. Uh, but as time went on, um, populations built up in these areas in, in um, southern Germany and eastern France uh, to such an extent that there were migrations and, and Celts or barbarians from this, this part of Europe started to impinge upon the Greek and Roman world, the Mediterranean world. So so um, in the um, uh, around about 400, we've got BC. We've got uh, Celts moving down into the Po Valley uh, in northern Italy, and from there beginning to raid down into Italy, and they actually surrounded Rome in around 390 BC. And a little bit later, some of these Celts moved over into the um, sort of Middle Danube Valley, and from there they uh, penetrated into Greece and they raided Delphi in 279. Whether they actually pillaged it or not is a, a moot point, but they raided did it. And um, this was written up by, by the Greeks. And then that band of Celts moved away again, beaten beaten back by the, um, the Greeks. Uh, and they moved into Asia Minor, what is now Turkey, and they settled near Ankara. So um, at that time, sort of it, when the Greeks and Romans were at their peak, uh, the Celts were these um, rather nasty barbarians who, who lived to the north and were always making trouble. So you mentioned the the one of the first dates you mentioned was 390 BC when they, you know, were doing some raiding. They must have been a, a relatively uh, well formed group of people to be doing that at that time. Where did the Celts first become identified as the Celts, and and when? 
Um, the, the, this is the the the, uh, the centre of a, a big debate that's going on at the moment. But if I can just um, sort of uh, start uh, part way through the debate, and we might come back to the beginning of it later. Um, but the the first um, reference we have got to Celts is a Greek reference uh, to the Celts in the sixth century BC, and uh, this is a Greek called Hecateus um, uh, talking about Celts being over um, against the the Atlantic in in Spain and so on. And it just so happens that um, some very recent work that was done by a colleague of mine on inscriptions uh, in southwestern Spain, um, inscriptions that are written in Phoenician, uh, he recognized that the language that they were, um, that the Phoenician was transcribing was in fact a Celtic language. And these go back to the 7th, possibly even the 8th century BC. So we know that there were people speaking this Celtic language back in the Bronze Age, back in the 8th century BC, and we know uh, that the Greeks were talking about them in the 6th century. So the, the big question is, how far back then into deep prehistory uh, do they go? Um, so, uh, and, and this is what, one of the big debates. This is one of the new things that has um, appeared since uh, I wrote the first edition of the book. Um, some of us now, if I can just sort of um, sum it up very briefly, um, some of us um, think that that, um, the Celtic language uh, started uh, in the Atlantic zone. Uh, in in the the bit from sort of Spain, France, including Britain and Ireland, in that that sort of zone, um, possibly as far back as the Neolithic, certainly in the Bronze Age. And um, my view is that it may well have been the sort of lingua franca, the language um, which people in along the Atlantic seaways um, communicated in. It was a, an Indo-European language. Um, we know these people were in contact in the Neolithic and Bronze Age. By sea, they were exchanging ideas, exchanging belief systems, exchanging cultural tra traits, and so on. Um, and um, uh, so complicated was the interaction that they must have been able to speak a language. So um, the hypothesis which we've developed is that um, Celtic may well have developed from that lingua franca. And um, whether it goes back to say 2000 BC or whether it goes back to 3000 or 4000 is, is the debatable point because we've got no trace of it. And it's uh, only archaeological supposition. Okay. So since the Celts are apparently ridiculously old. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think they are. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we must have uh, we must have some uh, other groups that have, I guess, spun off from the Celts and become their own thing um, throughout time. Uh, who, who would some of those groups that, some, that could be well known that people would know? Okay. Well, uh, the uh, Celts, as I, I said, were um, uh, in in barbarian Europe, in, in sort of middle middle part of Europe during the Greek and Roman period. Um, and then, of course, uh, during the Roman period, the, the Romans move uh, into this area that was once Celtic. They move through France, they move through Spain, they move through quite a lot of the British Isles in the period from about 100 BC to um, about 50 AD. They're sort of conquering all the time. And so uh, Roman culture replaces um, Celtic culture in most of those areas, except in uh, the extreme west, uh, in parts of Scotland, in Ireland, where the Romans didn't ever go, um, in Cornwall, where um, although the Romans did go, their presence was quite slight, and the same with Brittany, and, and probably in, in Brittany as well, where the Romans were, uh, but the Celtic languages were still spoken. And then, of course, you get, um, at the end of the Roman period, you get the uh, Germanic barbarians moving down and, and, and destroying aspects of Roman culture and replacing it. So um, uh, this is where the Germans and the French and the the Visigoths and all that lot uh, sort of take over. So what, what you've got left is in this, this Atlantic fringe, um, probably including Galicia in northern, northwestern Spain, uh, Brittany, um, Western Britain, uh, Ireland, and, and, and Scot Scotland. In that area, you've got a, a continuation of um, traditional Celtic culture, still telling uh, some of the traditional stories, um, he heroic stories of the past, still speaking a Celtic language. And of course, that language is still spoken today. My, my granddaughters um, speak a Celtic language. They
they speak Welsh, really? uh, which is a living yeah. Celtic language. Irish Gaelic is a living Celtic language. Breton is a living Celtic language, as is um, Scottish Gaelic. So, so there are still Celtic speakers in the world today. And there is a, a, a very strong feeling among uh, these communities in the West uh, that they do share a cultural heritage which has been lost in much of the rest of Europe, that they are the, the inheritors of this very, very deep, old Celtic culture. And they're very proud of this. I, I spend a lot of time um, uh, in Brittany, um, and a lot of my Breton friends are incredibly proud of their Breton culture. Um, and you have these fest nosts, these um, um, festivals um, celebrating the Celtic way of life, where they speak Celtic poetry, they s sing Celtic songs, uh, they, they develop their own Celtic music. So, so um, it's a very live thing uh, in the Western part of, of Europe, Northwestern part of Europe even today. All right. So earlier you mentioned Celtic culture. Uh, what defines early Celtic culture? I mean, for a barbarian based uh, society, what what is in the archaeological record that we can define as, as Celtic, early Celtic culture? Well, if, if we uh, take the sort of um, the classic Celtic period, the, this um, um, Celts contemporary with Greece and Rome, we, we learn a lot about um, Celtic culture from these from the Roman and Greek writers. Um, they tell us, first of all, it was very much a heroic society. Um, raiding was a, a dominant characteristic. The feast was a dominant characteristic. And if you think of it anthropologically, um, the feast was um, when uh, a lot of people got together, they drank a lot, there was a lot of boasting. And um, we've got a accounts of Celtic feasts. Um, and when they, uh, one, one account says when they cut up the, uh, the animal that was being cooked and gave out the cuts of meat, um, the, the chief charioteer, for example, got the thigh piece of the beast to eat. And if someone uh, thought he wasn't the chief charioteer, they got up and, and um, said, you, no, no, I should have that. You know, you, you shouldn't have that. I'm better than you. So, so the feast was a, a fantastic time when um, society sort of redefined itself. Uh, this cutting up of the meat and giving it out, giving the hero's portion, it's called, um, enabled society to reestablish uh, its values. And if uh, no one challenged the um, chief charioteer, then okay, from then on, he's remained the chief charioteer. So this was the time when uh, young men who wanted to aspire to, to greatness would get up and challenge. Um, one of the, the Greek writers says um, sometimes they, they came to blows and uh, sometimes people were even killed at feasts. Um, and uh, the, the uh, other thing you did at a feast would be to get up and say, uh, look, I'm such a great warrior. I'm going to lead a raid uh, tomorrow uh, or the next day against uh, our neighbors over the the hill there, and I'm going to bring back loads of women and cattle and so on. Who's going to follow me? It's going to be a successful raid. And um, people in the assembled company would get up and sort of put their hands up. And then the next morning when they were sober, uh, they were committed to, to um, uh, take part <laughs> in the raid. Um, now, if that raid was successful, um, then the young man who, who led it would rise in status and he would be able to cement his status by giving the proceeds of that raid to those who followed him. So there was this idea of, of your followers, and this is something the Greek and Roman writers write about, um, uh, your, your status is measured by your followers. And I think that's very interesting from the point of view of Facebook and things like that today. You know, um, <laughs> celebrities, their status right. is measured by their followers. Um, it's, it's just a, a Celtic way of life. Nice, nice. I, I also thought it sounded like you were discussing English football fans <laughs> earlier with, uh, you know, but I'm, but I'm not sure. That's just my American perspective. <laughs> yeah. I April, think we yeah. should also be glad that uh, we do not follow this tradition of being committed to what you do when you're drunk or agree to. <laughs> right. It could be problematic for a lot of people. Uh, so it sounds like there's some sort of well, it sounds like there's some connecting con traditions that kind of help define what a Celt is and who they are. But it also sounds like they're a really diffuse group. You know, they're spread all along mm -hmm. this large area, yep. you know, divided yep. by an ocean. Would the different groups of Celt have recognized that they were all part of one sort of cultural group and cultural uh. tradition? 
That, that's a very, very big question, that, and, and we, we keep worrying about it. Um, uh, the, my own guess, and it's only a guess, is that they probably didn't recognize that they were all one part of one people. Um, they were all divided up into tribes. Um, we've got lots and lots and lots of Celtic tribal names, and their allegiance was essentially to their tribe. And some of these tribes fought each other. So um, some some allied uh, with um, neighbors against uh, common enemies and so on. So there was this internecine warfare among the, the various Celtic groups. So I, I don't think to that extent they saw themselves as a Celtic nation or anything like that. Um, I think that is something that um, in the modern world we're probably putting on the Celts uh, uh, incorrectly. Um, but the one, one thing that um, would have um, linked them, I think, is, is a relatively um, common language. It would have been lots and lots of dialects and so on, uh, but a language that um, had developed from the same base and was more or less understandable from one end of the so-called Celtic world to the other. Uh, the other thing that linked them would be a particular love of an art style. Uh, we talk about Celtic art or Latin art, and um, this is a, a very, very lively, energetic art that is composed. It, it's an abstract art composed of swirls and whirls and, and heads that you can half see and they disappear into into shapes. It, it, it's a, a, a shape-shifting world. Um, and if you look at any article of, of Celtic art, you can almost sort of sense the, the, the energy of the people and the sort of the mystery of life. There's a shield from um, London that was dredged up um, uh, by Waterloo Bridge, uh, the, the bridge that goes a, a, across the River Thames is in the 19th century. And, and um, it's, it's fairly um, florid. Uh, it's got lots of these scrolls and, and so on on it. But if you look at it uh, long enough and sort of half close your eyes, it sort of resolves itself into faces with eyes peering at you. And then you look at it again and, and they sort of disappear. And I think this is deliberate. Uh, there's one great um, art historian, Paul Jakobstahl, uh, who wrote about this in the um, 1930s, 1940s. And he des described it as the Cheshire cat style of art, uh, you know, like Alice in Wonderland, that sometimes you see the cat in the tree and sometimes it's just the grin of the cat. And that's a brilliant way of, of sort of thinking about Celtic art. And, and this, uh, what we would recognize as Celtic art, you might find uh, in Bulgaria or you might find in Ireland. And um, there, there are great similarities, differences, of course, but great similarities. So um, there is a, a, a sort of homogenous uh, element to culture and language. Uh, but that said, um, I very much doubt whether the Irish would have seen themselves uh, as the same sort of people as those living in the middle of Bulgaria at the same time. Right. But if so, using kind of art and common language, if someone from Ireland ran into someone from Bulgaria, they might recognize that there were kind of shared commonalities, potentially shared stories um, and certain cultural traditions. <laughs> Yes, yes, I think that I think that's absolutely true. Um, uh, they would have recognised um, similar art. They possibly would have been able to communicate with each other in the same way that a Breton can nowadays can more or less communicate with a Welsh person, not terribly well. They're both speaking a Celtic <laughs> language, but they they can't really, uh, you know, they can read each other's language rather better than they can understand it being spoken. Um, I, I know this when my, my my granddaughters go to Brittany and and and. and stay in a house in Brittany that uh, they can't find, they can't very easily speak to, to the, the locals who are speaking Breton. But um, uh, th there would be similarities, certainly. And, and I think the, 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 there would have been similarities in the value systems as well. The, the idea of, of bravery in battle, the idea of the raid as being central to society, um, and some common stories. That story I, I told you about the, the hero's portion, uh, chopping up the, the, the beast at the feast and, and giving out according to status. There's a wonderful Irish tradition um, about a feast, and this is recorded in the um, heroic literature of Ireland, which is being written down in the late, latter part of the first century AD, but it, it's a long tradition. Um, and it's about um, a man who um, wanted to kill his enemies, so he invited them all to a feast, big feast, lavished a lot of money on it, um, and he went 
went round to each of them saying, I think you're, you're the most important guest here. Uh, um, and they all thought they were the m most important guest. And then they started arguing uh, and they uh, fought and they all killed each other. Um, uh, so he'd got all his enemies to kill each other. And there's a lovely line in this, this story that said, and when, when the sun rose the next morning, the blood was still flowing over the threshold. So it was obviously a very good party. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, on that note, um, we're going to take our first break and we will come back on the other side for more of a discussion on ancient Celts with Sir Barry Cunliffe. Back in a second. This network is listener supported. We're trying to move away from paid advertising while also creating new shows and supporting the ones we have. The APN has never and will never make a serious profit on our podcast. Every little dime we make goes back into the network and improving show quality. So become a member today at www.arcpodnet.com slash members to show your support, get some extras, and be a benefactor for archaeological education. Members get stickers, a coffee mug, a t-shirt, bonus content, early access to episodes, a private Slack team to talk to other members and the hosts, and full access to training on Team Black over at arccert.black. So check out our memberships at www.arcpodnet.com slash members today and support archaeological education. That's www.arcpodnet.com slash members. Now back to the show. All right, welcome back to the Archaeology Show, episode 39, and we are talking to Sir Barry Cunliffe about his recent new book, a second edition of The Ancient Celts. And Barry, when we were talking before the break, you were mentioning uh, in reference to one of April's questions about some sort of unifying perspectives about the ancient Celts and, you know, how we may have placed this this name Celts on them. Well, I'm obviously here in the United States, as is April, and it really had me thinking about the label we place on Native Americans and how, you know, they were hundreds of separate individual tribes, but they had a lot of commonalities in, in the way that they lived. Obviously, regional groups had commonalities in language. They had commonalities in artwork and uh, style of hunting and things like that. It, it just makes me wonder, you know, we look at these global perspectives on things. You're talking about the ancient Celts. I'm talking about Native Americans. I'm sure we can talk about Africa in a similar way. I'm sure we can talk about Australia in a similar way. It's kind of a commentary on just early life ways, you know, 1,000 uh, BC to six or so thousand BC and how people were just kind of struggling to survive in really similar ways across the planet. Does that sound about right? <laughs> yeah, yes, and it, it, it does. And also, it, there is um, an, an observer element here, isn't there? Um, if someone uh, like the Greeks and the Romans uh, is observing um, these barbarians, uh, they want to be able to sort of capture the idea of these barbarians and, and communicate it. So they simplify it and give it a name. And I, I think there is an element of that in it. Um, in the same way that, after all, we talk about Romans um, and the Roman world was very, very varied indeed, with lots of people speaking different languages and, and, and lots of different um, economic systems and even political systems. Uh, but there was a, a little bit of sort of overriding um, uh, Roman law and, and uh, Roman government. So it's, it's not quite a parallel. Yeah. So uh, leading up to this uh, conversation, I talked to a few people about, you know, what do you know about the Celts? Because I was reading this book and I, I wanted to understand what people knew already, people that don't study this regularly. And of course, what a lot of people said was referencing England and referencing, you know, Stonehenge and things like that. When did the Celts actually come to England? Do we know that? It's a very, very difficult question, and in, and it is in debate. Now, um, uh, if you'd asked me this question um, 20 years ago when I wrote the first edition of the book, uh, I would have said um, we uh, can't say that Stonehenge has anything to do with the Celts because Stonehenge was built between 3000 BC and about 1500 BC, and that's before we knew there were Celts here. Um, hmm. Now, uh, we've been thinking about the origins of the Celts and whether um, we can take um, the origin of the Celtic language and, and so on back into uh, the, the Bronze Age and even into the Neolithic period. It's, it becomes possible uh, to argue that possibly Stonehenge was built by people who spoke a Celtic language. Um, we'll hmm. never be able to prove that. Um, but, but this change in paradigm that we're, we're working on would allow us to um, put much of our early prehistory into a sort of um, Celtic-speaking part of the world. 
So this is a follow up for some of our some of our listeners. So we are talking about archaeology here, but we keep talking about language. And language is an identifier of these groups that we're studying archaeologically. So can you kind of explain to us how, how as an archaeologist, are we finding something like language, which is obviously a na- non-tangible element, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't leave mm-hmm. a remain in the same way that like a lithic or a ceramic pot, kind of the traditional archaeological objects do. Yep. Um, we all, all we can do as, as archaeologists is, is rely on um, a, a sort of fairly coarse thing to start with, which is the survival of place names, which we think are uh, Celtic in origin. And people have planned, mapped uh, the survival of place names. And it really does concentrate on uh, Western Europe and, and Britain and Ireland. Um, uh, but uh, that is just those names that come down to us uh, in, in recorded form. The other way of looking at at it is um, where the language is actually written down in some form or another. Well, we know the Celts um, didn't write, didn't have a script of their own. Um, Caesar says that when the Celts wanted to write anything, they wrote it in Greek. Um, uh, but we also know from this work of uh, John Cook in, in southwestern Iberia um, that in the 8th and 7th century, there were people speaking Celtic who actually used Phoenician script to write it. And they, they carved it on tombstones and, and, and uh, other stones of that, that sort. So we've got the actual language recorded in, in, in writing, but that's as far back as we can go. Before that, it's absolutely pure guesswork. We just do not know, uh, nor can we, uh, can, will, will we ever know. So um, before, before about 800, um, we've, we've just got to say, uh, I think it's likely to be like this, or I don't think it's likely to be like this, but uh, never ever will we be able to say, here's the evidence for it. The fact that they're using so many different, you know, this, they don't have their own written language, so they're adopting these other written languages is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, yes. Um, and because um, the, the, uh, in the Celtic world, uh, the word was spoken, you know, uh, and, and uh, it's mm-hmm. all oral tradition. So um, they would have um, learned uh, their, their history and their myths and beliefs and, and, and so on uh, orally. And, and we know that the Druids, who were um, the, the sort of educated class among the Celts, uh, were the teachers. Um, and um, I think it's Julius Caesar says that um, uh, the, the Druid, if you wanted to learn from a Druid, uh, you'd have to study for 20 years. Uh, and they did it all by oral teaching, Caesar says. Um, and he says it's because they wanted to keep uh, their knowledge secret. Well, it wasn't. It was because they didn't have a script. Um, uh, so so you can imagine um, a, a kid at, at his mother's side or father's side uh, would, would learn about history um, orally uh, and would um, sit down at these feasts and, and the these great Celtic feasts would have been time when uh, bards would have sung praises of people, sung songs about past heroes. And and this is how um, people understood the culture they belonged to and their ancestry uh, and their value system. Uh, They had no need to write it. Uh, They knew it uh, and they could tell each other it. And, and in, actually, the, the, the storyteller um, still goes or still went on uh, well into the 20th century in uh, AD uh, in both Ireland and, and in Brittany. Um, there, there are photographs taken at the beginning of the century of Breton storytellers um, who would be invited uh, to parties because they knew the traditions, the folk traditions of the people, and they would um, – uh, um, they would um, just uh, spend hours um, telling these stories uh, to the assembled company. It was the sort of thing you did on a long winter evening. <laughs> Sounds really nice, actually. <laughs> it's better um, than television. Yeah. So, <laughs> indeed. indeed, I think I saw a TV show about doing that once. Um, anyway, <laughs> they were. It was weird. They were all sitting around a fire, not looking at a TV. I don't know what happened. Um, you know, so um, there, there still are people, and, and I, I got this from your book. There are still people that identify, at least in the UK, as being of you know Celtic ancestry and and identify as Celts. Um, when 
when did the Celts start to die out in other parts of Europe or are there still pockets of people that identify uh, strongly with Celts? Because the UK is really strongly identified with that. I mean, my wife and I went to Scotland a couple of years ago and even Scotland up there, obviously there's Celtic imagery all over the place and all the touristy things, and stuff like that. But are there other parts of Europe where that's still the case or is it pretty much, uh, pretty much gone? It, it's pretty much gone. Um, it's seen to be uh, over most of Europe, a part of the past. E- even in most of France, it's a sort of seen to be distant past, but not in Brittany. The, the, the Bretons are very, very proud of their, their Celtic heritage. And, and so too are the Galicians in northwestern Spain, um, although they don't speak mm. anymore a Celtic language. They, they claim that they are of Celtic ancestry. And um, their music um, is is very Celtic. Um, I, I was at um, one of these festivals in in Brittany um, a few years ago, and um, uh, this was in in an open marketplace, and people were singing Breton songs. And a coach drew up, and out came um, a, a gang of uh, youngsters who were all dressed in beautiful black and white, and they were Galithians, and they had come to this festival to sing their Galithian songs and play their Galithian bagpipes. And the, the Bretons also have bagpipes, as, as of course, do the Irish and, and the Scots. So um, there is this sort of musical tradition um, w- which binds them. So I would say the Galithians would regard themselves, this northwestern Spanish group would regard themselves uh, as of Celtic ancestry. Um, and But what we've got to remember is um, that um, there is a lot of politics in this that uh, the the Irish, the Scots, the Welsh, the Cornish, the Bretons, and the Galithians are all trying to make a statement saying, we are not English, or we are not French, or we are not Spanish. We are not Spanish, we are Galithians, we are not French, we are Bretons. So they're, they're enhancing nowadays their sense of Celticness um, to give them an identity which differs from that of the, the, the main nation states. So there is an element of that in it. So there is a bit of reinvention of the Celts going on as well. Um, no, no bad thing at all. Um, I think um, it, the reinvention is going on very well in, in music. Um, there are lots of Celtic music groups who are very, very inventive and are using Celtic Celtic, ancient Celtic idiom uh, in, in a very creative modern way. So um, from this point of view, um, uh, Celtic uh, life is very, very much with us and very much a, a developing theme. So speaking of other Celtic influences, besides some of the graphic imagery we mentioned and then just the music you were talking about there, uh, what about other Celtic influences? Is there food out there that I could identify if I go to, um, you know, someplace in Europe or the UK that's like, man, this has got serious Celtic origins? I mean, besides just ripping off a hunk of, you know, <laughs> mutton and then, and then chomping on that. Um, or what about place names and stuff like that in Europe where the Celtic influence is kind of dying out, but are there other things still identifiable as Celtic in origin? Um, yeah, I will. I wouldn't say food. I, I couldn't sort of put my heart on hand on my heart and, and say that's Celtic food. Um, uh, and I don't think they're trying even to reinvent a, a sort of Celtic food. Um, but um, uh, names, place names, for example, um, uh, and there, there are place names in France, uh, in French-speaking parts of France, in, in um, Spanish-speaking parts of Spain, uh, which, are, which are Celtic place names. They, they go right back um, to, to the Celtic language. Briga, for example, B-R-I-G-A, uh, you find uh, in, in the whole of the Western parts of Europe as, as a place name. Uh, that is a Celtic place name. Um, so, um, uh, and you, you'll find uh, sort of elements of that, but um, you, you've got to know the background before you can spot them very easily. But, uh, you know, uh, the French do like to um, uh, speak of their Celtic past. I think most most Europeans uh, like to believe that, um, that they do have an element of, of, of Celt in their, in, in their genes. And when... Um, uh, years ago, the European Union was was beginning to develop as an idea. Uh, the, the some of the politicians um, used, I, I think, wrongly used, but uh, that, that's beside the point. They they use the the idea of the Celt as being the unifying factor for Europe and saying we are all Celts and now we are all going to be Europeans. I think that that's that's too simple, um, but it it's not very far below the surface. Um, I've got Hungarian friends. 
those who are very proud uh, that um, their ancestors were, were Celts uh, and, 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 and Bulgarians for that matter as well, although they've got many overlays of other cultures. So um, I, I think it's there. It's, it's in the consciousness. You know, in the United States, we as archaeologists, there's often a slightly political tone, especially when you're working with things like Native American groups because of national identity and cultural identities. So how do these different groups that still connect with uh, Celtic heritage and are sometimes using it to kind of contest larger national heritage feel about some of the new kind of research and developments that are coming out about who the Celts were and how they functioned as a society. Is this helping to kind of reinforce what they're trying to do in maintaining their culture? Or is it seen as kind of contesting their larger ideals, ideas? Well, to start with, a, f a few years ago, when we started um, exploring this idea of um, Celtic origins uh, in, in the Atlantic zone, you know, deep, deep-rooted Celtic origins. Um, uh, one or two of the um, uh, the Scots, Scottish groups, in particular, um, were really upset by this because uh, they they had a vision of Celts originating in Central Europe and spreading out into the West. Um, uh, but as we went on, and we we were saying, well, you know. If if we are right and, and the Celtic origins are, are in the Atlantic zone, in fact, you've got a much, much deeper rooted uh, culture than you thought you had. You weren't just a load of, sort of drunken French and Germans coming across and, and, <laughs> and, and beating up the locals. You you know, you, you are ancient peoples. And, and this has become more and more and more popular. Um, so I think politically, they're, they're beginning to take this on. Um, and... What, what saddens me a bit is, is seeing the Celtic languages uh, become weaker and weaker. In Wales, there is a, a, a massive effort to keep Celtic strong, um, uh, uh, Welsh strong, and, and uh, it, it's used in government and, and so on. But um, in, in places like Brittany uh, and, and even in Ireland and, and in Scotland, it, it's beginning to lose its power, and it really does need a, a massive effort to keep those languages going. Um, interestingly, Cornwall, which was Celtic, Celtic speaking until this is in the extreme southwest of Britain. It was Celtic speaking until um, certainly in the 18th and early 19th century, and then the language more or less died out. It's being revived, and there are groups who are trying to reconstruct the Cornish language and are now um, uh, um, putting um, bilingual signposts up and um, are having Celtic festivals and so on. So there is a real feeling for um, uh, sort of tr trying to hold on. Uh, to some of these ancestral uh, um, traits and, and build them into modern life. And, and I think that is wholly good. Yeah, I'd, I'd heard recently that uh, I think uh, Duolingo, which is a online language learning service, I think it was Duolingo, uh, they recently added Klingon to languages you can uh, learn from Star Trek. And I'm like, like yeah. that's interesting, but how about all the languages that are actually dying <laughs> yeah, that we have? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we have? Yeah. Let's, let's add some of those, yeah. right? Um, yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, OK, we have some more questions and some stuff to talk about, especially for the second edition of the book. And we will do that right after this break. Save on O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner. Get two cans of O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner for just eight dollars. Valid in store only at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Okay, welcome back to The Archaeology Show, episode 39, and we are finishing up our discussion with Sir Barry Cunliffe about the second edition of his book, The Ancient Celts. So, one thing I wanted to spend a, a good amount of time on, Barry, and we've already kind of covered some of this stuff um, because you've mentioned it, what... What has been some of the big changes to prompt like a full second edition of this book? I mean, we've talked about the last 20 years. There must have been some some pretty significant things. What I want to know is, are there any new sites we can relate to the Celts that have prompted this? Or is it really just reinterpretations or analysis of, of existing stuff that's contributed the bulk of the information? Um, well, 
it's both really um, re re reinterpretation. Certainly, this this idea that um, the whole um, Celtic language and, and possibly Celtic lifestyles might have started in the West is is something quite new that uh, has worked has begun to work through, um, and that does play a part in the book. Although, as I say, it is a hypothesis and it, it, it is a developing hypothesis. Uh, but at the same time, there have been a, a lot of um, excavations all across Europe sort of ma major uh, finds. Um, uh, some of the, the, the big changes have, I think, come in our understanding of what was happening in Central Europe in about the 6th, um, 5th uh, sixth, sixth centuries BC. This is um, in what we would call the Hallstatt period, the late latter part of the, um, the the early part of the the latter part of the of the Iron Age, um, and um, uh, particularly with um, sites which we used to call the the sort of princely um, centres, uh, these were fortified sites like the Heuneberg, for example, in in Germany, or Vix uh, in in France, um, where we knew that there were fortifications, and uh, some of these had been dug, uh, and um, they they were clearly um, elite places. Um, but uh, the new work that has gone on uh, that uh, has shown them to be not just sort of little princely enclaves, uh, but the centers of very large concentrations of population. So we've got to sort of rethink some of our ideas about origins of what we might call towns or cities now. Uh, we knew that in the Latin period, so say in the second, first century BC, uh, there were these large opida, great agglomerations of people. People, uh, manufacturing things, living together, trading, and so on, uh, the, the sort of beginning of towns. But now we can push this back uh, to um, probably the fifth century when these um, enclaves developed. Uh, they were usually what we would call central places. They were important places on various routes, so they could benefit by uh, from trade. Uh, many of them were linked into uh, trading networks with the Mediterranean. They were um, getting Mediterranean luxury goods uh, like Greek black-figured and red-figured pottery coming through and things like that. Um, and they were certainly um, seats of, of elite um, where the, the local princes probably lived. But now we can see farms dotted all around them. And um, so the, these places were magnets for population to come together. And that's a very major step, I think, if you're thinking of human development. Um, if you're all living in uh, scattered farms, that's, that's one thing. Uh, but if you're beginning to come together, you're developing a different kind of society, uh, a rather more complex society that is more, uh, more interdependent. Uh, and uh, that, that's a major major uh, social change uh, coming about now several centuries before we thought. Okay. You know, that, that reminds me, I should have asked this earlier when we were talking about it, and, and you, I think you may have kind of alluded to some time frames, but I want to know specifically, you mentioned the early Celts, especially with their dealings with the Greek and Romans, uh, Greeks and Romans were more barbarians. I mean, surely they, you know, ate somehow, but it doesn't sound like they were um, strictly <laughs> farmers and, uh, and more pastoral when did that uh, when do we think that transition happened from that barbarian lifestyle to the more farming lifestyle oh I, I think they were farmers um, way 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 back um, yeah. the, the, this society um, even though uh, it was um, uh, it had an element of being a heroic society with raiding and, and things like that um, it, it had a very very s uh, strong agricultural base the, these were uh, people rooted in the ground rooted in production of um, all the cereal crops uh, and um, the husbanding of, of all the usual sort of farmyard animals. That provided the basis uh, for these, what I would regard as largely non-productive social activities like raiding and feasting and things like that um, uh, to, to happen. So it, it's very much, um, I think, a graded society. And you see this um, if you look at the, old, um, the Irish law tracts, which reflect Ireland in the first century. Century AD, um, you see this again, um, a, a, a very much um, a, a society of different grades of different hierarchies. Um, now, the, the the Lord, the chief, the, the whatever you want to call him, um, wasn't rooted to the ground in in Irish society. He he owned cattle. 
Uh, but what he did with those cattle was to hand them out uh, to his underlings to look after for him. And he took a tithe of those cattle. So his status was measured in the cattle. Uh, he had no responsibility for looking after them. Uh, that was the job of other people. And those other people provided him with um, with milk and butter and, and candles and, and, and corn and, and everything else that he needed. And that gave him the freedom uh, – to be a, a bit of a, a, an entrepreneur in his own right and to go off and, and lead raids uh, and um, uh, to, to be above the productive level of society. But that productive level was very much there. So we've got various grades of, of civ civility from the totally unfree uh, to um, people who were being patronized by, by, by the elite. So this system of production and the existence of these larger population centers, uh, for me, kind of raises some of the questions about production of art. Um, I mean, one of the things that the Celts are really known for, obviously, is their intricate artwork and their amazing metalwork um, that they're capable of. So does it appear that some of these large population centers are also essentially production centers. Yeah, yes, absolutely so. Um, if we go back to, say, the, the these very early um, complex centers in, in the sort of sixth, fifth centuries, um, they were making things there, um, small things like brooches and, and, and things like that, um, that could be handled by the elite in what we would call a prestige goods economy. So, um, uh, the, the way it worked was um, that the elite were able to um, acquire luxury goods from outside their own area, like, like Greek wine or Greek pottery or Greek bronzes or something like that. And that would come into the elite. Um, and the elite um, displayed that and, and that gave them their status. Uh, they might give some of the lesser items down to their underlings, um, but they also needed uh, other goods like brooches, uh, which might be made um, in the elite households, give these brooches down to um, people of a lower status. So there was very much a sort of gift exchange pyramid, and you needed production, you needed goods being produced locally uh, to, to feed that kind of hierarchy. Um, when, when you get on, on later um, into the Latin period, into the second and first century BC, it was becoming a lot more complicated then, because um, these um, centers, places like Manching in, in, in Germany, um, uh, were uh, linked um, indirectly to the Mediterranean world. And we know from Roman writers that a lot of things were pouring out of the barbarian world to the, to the Mediterranean world that the Mediterranean really wanted, um, mater raw materials, hides, um, furs, uh, and slaves. And th those were the things which were being traded into the Roman world. The Roman world was um, a great consumer world, consuming uh, raw materials, consuming manpower. And it was these Celtic barbarians on, on the northern side that were feeding, feeding the Roman economy in some ways. So that... Um, in this way, these centers grew more and more complex. The native centers grew more and more complex and were producing uh, greater and greater quantities of, of goods. Um, some of them were being mass produced. Pottery uh, by the, the first century BC was being mass produced on, on a large scale, fine pottery. Uh, but alongside that, of course, you've got the, the real craftsmen making these items of, of brilliant Celtic art, but very much for the elite market. So first, I adore that this fairly complex society with, you know, incredible technological and production skills is the barbarian world. Uh, it just, it shows the perspective so well. It's wonderful. Um, but with the development of, you know, really skilled craftsmen and artisan, mass production of ceramics, specifically for trade. Can you, are you archaeologically able to identify sort of specific producers or production spots um, for some of these goods and then kind of recreate the movement of these goods and trade networks? So say this center is producing this style or this artisan who appears to be located here has this sort of signature design or um, pattern that then we see trading and moving across the Celtic and outside world. 
Yeah, I can, I can give you two examples of that. Um, one, one of the sites I excavated, um, an Iron Age hill fort of, of this period at Danebury, which is in the center of southern Britain, um, there were people there who were making um, bits of horse gear, uh, terret rings and, and bits of bridle uh, out, out of bronze and casting them in a very, very distinct way. They had their own, own really um, clever style. Now, um, I can't prove that they were being made at Danebury, but we know that not very far away in a settlement site, a place called Gussage, they were actually making these things because the clay molds and so on have been found. So um, now, how do we interpret that? There are these there, there, there's a craftsman or, or a craft school who uh, are really focused on a particular set of horse gear, making a set of horse gear. Um, were they, um, uh, did they move around, uh, which I think they might have done, um, a traveling uh, craftsman going from uh, one household to another, to another, to another? Or were they, the, the, were they owned, these craftsmen, uh, by, by the elite? Um, were they owned, for example, by um, the person who lived in Danbury, who um, hired them out to his friends? So we, we can see their signatures, uh, and seeing their signatures, um, we, we can begin to ask questions about how society worked. How did the craftsmen actually feature in society? So, and there's another example. Um, I did um, a, a fairly extensive excavation at a port on the southern coast of Britain, a place called Hengisbury head, which was um, in contact with the, um, the Bretons, um, the, the Celts in Brittany. And we can trace the trade, exactly what was happening, uh, because in Hengisbury, we've got pots of very distinctive Breton type um, being imported. And I don't think they were just importing the pots. They were importing what was in the pots. We don't know what it was, but, you know, relishes, honey, uh, butter, um, cheeses, some, something like that. They were importing this from Brittany. They were also importing Roman wine from Brittany in Amphrey. And what they were giving back, well, we can begin to see this. They were um, collecting old gold and, and melting it down. Um, and they were collecting um, uh, old glass and melting that down and probably exporting that. Um, and But, but particularly, um, th there is a kind of um, stone called a Kimbridge shale, which they were making into bracelets. And that was very much in demand on the continent. So we see these bracelets being uh, traded for whatever was coming in with the pottery. So we can begin to build these trading networks uh, and understand them uh, fr from the artifacts we find in the settlement sites. Okay. Well, we've only got a couple uh, time for a couple more questions, Barry. So I wanted to uh, make sure we get a couple things in. Uh, royalty has always been a huge deal, obviously, in the UK and in Europe. Has there ever been anyone who claimed uh, Celtic ancestry that's ascended up the the royal lines onto the onto the throne of any sort of country? Uh, not as far as I'm aware. Certainly not 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 in France, not in Spain, um, and not in not in England. Um, the, the, the kings of England, uh, their roots are very much more recent than that. So uh, no <laughs> one has really claimed. Um, the, the Welsh, uh, Owen Glendower, for example, might have claimed um, uh, ancestry, for, uh, Celtic ancestry from the Welsh, but uh, that line died out. So, uh, so n n none of the modern royals, I'm afraid, can, can claim anything very far back. <laughs> nice. Okay. N nothing they'll admit to anyway, right? <laughs> so, all right. <laughs> so what's, what's something that you really want people to learn from, from reading your book, especially reading the second edition? If they didn't know anything about the Celts, what's a, what's a big takeaway you want them to get from it? I think I want them to try and understand that the Celtic society was very different from our society. Um, it, it was... Um, a frightening society in many ways. Headhunting was prevalent, uh, slave raiding and all these things. But I don't want people to judge it. I want them to be able to stand back and say, yes, I understand that society. Um, and it worked in a particular way because 
uh, uh, that was how people lived and worked in those times. We can't, we mustn't judge those people. We must try and look at them uh, from the point of view of their own time. And I think that will help us perhaps to understand that our, our world, the world we live in, is very, very complex. And we must be incredibly tolerant and understanding of people whose cultures are very different from our own. Well, that sounds like a good uh, a good lesson for studying all cultures of the world and then understanding our own as well. So that's uh, very well said. Um, well, thanks a lot, Barry, for coming back on the Archaeology Show. And I know the next time you have something coming down the line, you're you're uh, very prolific. I mean, three shows in one year. I don't know. That's uh, that's pretty good. So <laughs> we're gonna have to make you a co-host at some point. Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me. I've I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed talking to you both. No problem. No problem. So. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. All right. So check the show notes for links to the previous shows that uh, the previous episodes of the archaeology show that Barry has been on. And of course, we'll have a link to the book on our website as well. And uh, you can check all that out and feel free to leave any comments on this. We can see if we can get them off. Maybe uh, maybe we can get those over to Barry and he can answer them for you. But otherwise, thanks a lot, Barry. And thanks a lot, April, for coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Archaeology Podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. You can provide feedback using the contact button on the right side of the website at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash archaeology. Or you can email chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Please like and share the show wherever you saw it so more people can have a chance to listen and learn. Send us show suggestions and follow ArcPodNet on Twitter and Instagram. This show was produced by the Archaeology Podcast Network. Opinions are solely those of the hosts and guests of the show. However, the APN stands by their hosts. This show is edited by Christopher Sims of the Go Dig a Hole podcast. Go check it out. The song Energy was provided by BenSound.com. Lots of great royalty-free music over there. Check out our next episode in two weeks. And in the meantime, keep learning. Keep discovering new things and keep listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Have an awesome day. This show is produced and recorded by the Archaeology Podcast Network, Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle in Reno, Nevada at the Reno Collective. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info. Is your vehicle stopping like it should? Does it squeal or grind when you brake? Don't miss out on summer brake deals at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts.